Good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon, I should say. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for part of Homecoming at Home. Uh, we are thrilled to have you here today for our Georgetown Campus Beehives virtual tour. Uh, and we, we are joined uh, today by Dr. William Hahn. Uh, Dr. Hahn is director of the George Squared program, a joint venture between the Georgetown University Medical Center and George Mason University. He holds faculty appointments in the biology department and science, uh, the biology department and science, technology, and international affairs program of the School of Foreign Service. Uh, his research and teaching focus on uh, his research and teaching focus is on sustainability, evolutionary medicine, molecular evolution, and bee biology. Dr. Han has kept bees for over 10 years uh, and chairs the Georgetown Bee Campus Initiative, um, which you will get to learn quite a bit about today. Um, so welcome, Dr. Hahn. I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Amanda. Whoops. Um, and welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for the invitation to talk. And uh, I really appreciate being able to explain a few of the details about the B Campus program. Uh, what I would like to do today is give a few comments about the B Campus program. Uh, which is a sort of an umbrella program for the honeybees that we have on campus. Then I'll switch it over to a video tour of the actual beehives on campus. Um, I wanna say that the Bee Campus program focuses on developing habitat in particular that supports native pollinators. Uh, uh, there's often a bit of confusion between native pollinators and what they are and honeybees bees and what they are. And the short answer is that honeybees are not native to the new world. They're essentially farm animals, but they're incredibly good subjects to work with for teaching biology, for teaching uh, any number of other, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, working on a little technical detail, detail here. Um, trying to get my video to work. Uh, but I'll continue on until the video is, is worked out. So the B Campus program aims to develop uh, resources on campus, including habitat. And there we go. Now I'm back on. Welcome again, everyone. Uh, and that includes gardens. We have two gardens that we're developing, one at Regents Hall, which you see right here. It looks messy, but that's nature. Nature is messy. A lot of different native plants that were uh, growing in this garden in an effort to encourage the development of native bees uh, and other pollinators on campus. Now, um, there are other aspects of the program. Uh, pollinators need places to nest and breed, so we're developing some resources there. But we have this garden at Regents and another garden on the podium at the Med Center. Now that's the general framework for the program overall. We're incorporating elements into various courses and uh, working on some signage, uh, doing some uh, tours of campus and things of that sort. But I'm certain that many of you think honeybees when you think of pollinators. And indeed, honeybees are incredibly important pollinators. If you look at the role of honeybees in North American agriculture, the value of pollinator services actually exceeds the value of honey produced in the US. The reason for that is that you can make honey anywhere in the world, but you have to be there to pollinate your crop plants. So almonds, for example, are completely dependent upon uh, honeybee pollination or nearly completely so. And it's a several, uh, it's a very, very important industry in the US. Now, what I'm gonna do is shift it over to a, another, file, so I can get this going here. And this is a video that we took a few weeks ago that is um, a tour of the beehives. Uh, the reason we took a video rather than having you out there in the field with us and the, the, the uh, apiary, Georgetown apiary is up on Observatory Hill, uh, two reasons. One of which we couldn't predict what the weather would be today. As it turns out, it's great weather today. It'd be a really good day to do a tour, but we could not have predicted that a few weeks ago. The second reason is that 
it's right next to the uh, chilling plant and, and makes a tremendous amount of noise. And we didn't know what the background noise would be on uh, a, a presentation like that. So I've actually muted the video that went all, goes along with this uh, tour and I'll be talking over that, but it allows me to stop the video and annotate some key features and the like. But you should feel free to ask any questions. I can easily pause it and explain whatever. But here we go with a tour. Let me pull this file up. Okay. So we are up on Observatory Hill. This is just above the chilling plant, which is across the parking lot from uh, Yates. I have two individuals with me. I'm going to pause it for a second. But you can see the observatory there, this bed of gravel, which is actually really good for bees because it keeps some pests at a minimum. And we have a series of eight uh, beehives on the hill. So I am very capably aided by two individuals here, one of whom on the left is uh, Allie Smith, who's a student in the School of Nursing and Health Sciences. And on the right is uh, uh, Tierney Monahan, who are, both of these individuals may be joining us today on this video, but both have kept bees before and they know what they're doing. So they were a tremendous help while I tried to video and explain what's going on as they video. So this is the whole suite of hives. We use them for instructional purposes. We teach a beekeeping class in the spring and pairs of students each get a hive that they work with they go in, they do inspections, they, they take care of all kinds of things um, as a part of the, the course. Now, when you're gonna do an inspection, which is what we're doing here, you wanna know why you're going in and we wanna see is there a healthy queen in there or evidence of the queen. And we wanna make certain that all things look good on the inside. We actually had a surprise when we got to this hive. The first thing you wanna do is see what kind of activity you have in the entrance. So I'm gonna pause it here. This is a bit of screen which reduces the entrance because at this time of year into September, beginning of October, there is actually what's referred as to a nectar dearth. There's not that much nectar out there. There's a fair bit of pollen, but not much nectar. So the bees are losing the colony, the hive is losing weight at this time of year. They're eating down the honey that they've stored because there isn't a replacement out there in nature. Also, um, it's warm and they're burning a lot of energy because they think it's, you know, it's time to go out and see what's going on. So they're flying and burning a lot of energy. So they're actually losing the energy stores, honey in the colony and they're out foraging for more, not finding a whole lot of honey, but they do find some pollen. Now we wanna to look to see, is there activity going in and out? Is there any fighting, any obvious uh, uh, evidence of disease? But another thing we wanna see, we had a bee come in just on cue here in a second. I'll pause it when we get there are they bringing in pollen? So in just a second, you'll see a bee land and it has two uh, bright bags of pollen on, there you go, right there. This bee right there has on its hind legs baskets where it stores the pollen that it's gathered from uh, the flowers that it's visiting and brings it back into the hive to be stored, which is uh, the major protein source for the bees in the hive. So we see that being going in, okay, great. We're happy with the activity here. The plentiful uh, bees going in, they're guarding the entrance from uh, intruders and everything looks uh, quite nice. Now, the second thing you wanna do is see, is their weight inside? Without even opening the box up, does it weigh anything? So in this case, both are gonna come up and lift the hive in the back. And you'll see it goes up pretty easily, which is not a super good sign because a hive at this size, this time of year, should weigh uh, 60 pounds or better, probably go approaching 100 if you count everything else. And then um, we um, uh, know something about what we should find on the inside. Now, in this case, what I'm pointing out is that the box on the bottom is taller than the two upper boxes. The traditional arrangement in this part of the world is to have a deep box on the bottom and a medium box or more than one medium box above. And the bottom box is where the brood or the young bees are uh, cultured. That's where all of the reproduction, uh, the egg laying and larval rearing and all that happens. And honey and pollen are stored above. So we're gonna keep an eye on these things as expectations. Now, the components of the hive now 
Um, each has a tool in their hand and uh, Ollie has some particularly large gloves that she has some trouble with later. So she's pulling off the outer cover. Tierney has a smoker. She's going to give a few puffs there. Then they're going to pop open the inner cover. Um, again, Allie, we need to get smaller gloves for Allie. Um, they pop off the inner cover, uh, cover right there. And what we do is we have uh, one problem in this area, which is um, a small beetle that's an African, accidental African introduction. And the beetles can cause a big mess inside the hives. Uh, so we put Swiffers, these are the things you buy in the grocery store that you put on the end of a mop to wipe your floors. And the Swiffers have little fibers that entangle the legs of the beetles. And that's one way of controlling them without adding any chemicals to your, your colony. Now that sticky stuff you see them pulling off is propolis. It's sap from trees that the bees bring back and they use it as kind of a glue as well as a substance to plug up holes. There is an argument that it has antibacterial properties, so it's somewhat of a household insect, uh, 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 antibiotic. Okay, now these are frames. This happens to be missing two frames, but she's pulling off a frame. The frame now has um, some plastic foundation on the bottom, which is embossed with little hexagons that give the bees a little bit of a head start. Now they'll do this on their own if you let them, but this just accelerates things a little bit more. Furthermore, the rigidity of the plastic keeps it easier to manage as you're pulling it in and out of the hive. And the bees will pull wax. Young bees can make wax from uh, eating, uh, they, they use the sugars that they're getting from nectar and they ex extrude a little bit of wax on their bellies and they use that to pull out these cells and make honeycomb. The plastic has a real light coating of wax on it to get them started, but the bees generate most of the wax. Okay, so they will fill this whole frame eventually. This time of year is a little bit late, but um, you gotta start somewhere. So I'll pull this up on the side. You can see the comb is kind of extending up from the foundation. That brownish, it, wax comes out white, and the brownish is from the bees walking all over it and a little bit of propolis that's uh, kind of picked up as they walk around and left behind on the cells, on the wax. Again, it has antibiotic properties. So um, there's an argument that that makes for a healthier uh, comb. And really old comb is almost black because it's been used so much. Okay, so I was looking at this and what we're trying to find is, are there honey stores? Uh, are there excessive beetles or wax moths or other problems? Uh, are there enough bees? Uh, is there any evidence of reproduction in the colony? Uh, all of these things that just give us some sense as to the, the overall health of the hive. Um, now she's moving some frames over to get to the middle because that's where most of the action is. Honey is stored preferentially on the sides and on the top and the brood is uh, in a central area in the middle of the colony. So what she's doing here is she sees, okay, this is a fairly heavy frame. And poor Allie's gonna have a little a mishap coming up in a few minutes here. Um, this one has a little bit of comb on it, a few bees. Uh, at this time of year, because there's very little nectar, they don't have that influx of sugar to make more wax. So they're gonna walk along. Trading off. Um, you see they're both well protected, full body suit. Uh, Tierney's wearing rubber gloves and Allie is wearing leather gloves. Um, bit by bit, you start shedding gear. I typically wear just a jacket and very thin nitrile gloves are sometimes bare handed. I haven't worn leather gloves in a while. It's not to be macho or anything. It's just the dexterity that you gain with the rubber gloves is significantly greater. So this is a really light box moving to the side. Now we're gonna look at the second box. This we expect to see more honey. We also expect to see pollen and we hope to see the beginnings of some reproduction in there, brood. Now this on the top is a mixture of propolis and a little bit of comb. Bees, as with nature, abhor a vacuum. If there's a space, they'll try to fill it. Except a space which is about what you see between the frames there. And the reason they don't fill that is that that is what's referred to as bee space. It's about the width you need for a bee to crawl through. 
And if it's smaller than that, they'll fill it with propolis. If it's bigger than that, they'll fill it with wax. If it's that size, they'll leave it alone because they want to be able to crawl through it. Okay, now the, the frames are kind of glued together by the propolis, so they have to work on this and ease them apart. Sometimes it takes a little bit of effort. Um, these tools that they're using come in a couple of different uh, versions. Some have hooks, some have angles. Pyrenees using one which just has a, a, a blade on the end and an angle, a hook on the, I'm sorry, a, a hook on the other end. Uh, Ali has one that has both an angled end and a hook. Uh, but again, some of it's just preference. Okay, so now we're pulling out a frame. You can see this has is full comb. You can see it's dark. That's where they had brood before. See a few more bees here. You see there's not a whole lot else happening. There's not too much in that particular frame. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, full of wax. The comb is there. It's just that there isn't any anything in the comb. Uh, and the comb could have uh, pollen. It could have honey. It could have nectar. It could have eggs. It could have larvae. All these things are signs of a growing colony, a growing hive. Um, the numbers in a beehive peak, generally speaking, in about July and August, then they start dwindling a little bit. And one transition you have is the bees, right about September, October, start making new bees that actually have to live through the winter. So here we pull out, this frame has lots and lots of honey on it. Uh, we'll have a little bit of trouble with some of the angling here, but let me see if I can pause this. There we go. Okay, so this is cap honey right here. The cells were pulled out, they filled it up with nectar, they beat their wings like mad and evaporated the water off. And when it gets down to about 17% water, they cap it with more wax. In that situation, it'll stay more or less at 17% uh, uh, water. And because of the acidity, the concentration of sugar and the enzymes that the bees have put in there, it will not ferment or decompose. That's the honey that you'll get in a jar of honey. Uh, processes are to take a whole frame, which is full honey, slice off the top, spin it in a centrifuge, and uh, we usually run it through some kind of filtration to get rid of the bee bar bit, bits and wax and whatnot, and then bottle that. Okay, so this is just a little bit of honey, but this is good sign. This is telling me that they're bringing in nectar hill, they're making honey, um, that there's uh, uh, enough there for them to get through the winter on the assumption that the rest of the hive has something similar to this. Um, what we would likely do, and uh, we may have done it already, I can't remember, is take off that top box because it's really just adding a bunch of void which can attract some of the pests that we uh, know about, such as uh, the hive beetles. Um, it's, more, it's more difficult for the bees in this colony to protect that, to manage it, to keep the temperatures where they need to be, uh, things of that sort. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to pause it for one second here. Um, I see we have a question. Okay, Niels Nelson is asking if uh, milder winters earlier spring have changed. Um, bees are incredibly generalist in their biology. Honeybees, the, 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 what's called the Western honeybee, is native to everywhere from the northernmost parts of Europe all the way down to the tip, the horn of Africa, and well into Central Asia and throughout the mid mid, mid, uh, mid East. So if you imagine the whole collection of climates in that range of territories, honeybees can handle it. And that includes heat, seasonality, rainfall, elevation, a whole range of issues. Now the bees that are used in the US for the most part are what originally they were what referred to as German bees or black bees or from Northern Europe. Then Italian bees or Southern Mediterranean bees were brought in and they're just different subspecies. Most of what we have in the US is not really from one area. That's a whole mixture of hybrids and all kinds of crossovers and just generally they're mutts. But what that means, if you look in the U.S., if we grow things everywhere from Florida well up into Canada, and not just the U.S., but well into Canada, North America, that range of, of climatic conditions is also um, uh, something that bee, honeybees can handle. So if we have changes in temperature here, 
the bees that we are using here, they're brought in from all over the, uh, the country. Very little is imported uh, from other countries these days because of uh, various uh, quarantine restrictions. But um, there's so much inherent adaptability in a colony of bees that the, the milder winters generally don't cause too much problem. However, you'll see an e evidence of something that happened this year in abundance, partly because of the very mild winter we had last winter. And that is because so many colonies made it through the winter this past winter, they were raring to go in the spring and they swarmed heavily. And for those of you in this area, you may have noticed a lot of calls about swarms and articles in the post and elsewhere. Um, now, maybe because so many people are home and they're seeing these things, but in, in, there were many, many calls uh, on swarm alerts and they're still happening. And I'll show you what's going on in just a slide uh, two on that one. Uh, another question, okay. Um, now, um, I'm keep going here. So Allie and uh, Tierney are making their way through. They're trying to go to the next frame and they pull this out and take a look. Again, even more honey. That's all solid honey in the middle there. Um, and, um, you know, reasonable bee population. I'm not super excited about it, but enough. We're still in the second box. Um, we want to make certain that we have a nice population of bees to get into and across the winter because there's very little reproduction in the months of November and December. And those bees that are that are born, if you will, in uh, um, September, October, they have to make it all the way until next February, March. They're long lived bees. In the summer, a bee typically lives only about six weeks at the most. In the winter, as much as six months. So these need to be healthy, free of diseases, well fed going into the winter. And that will allow them to cluster and keep the queen uh, warm throughout the winter. You know, in this uh, frame. Dr. Han, uh, we Amanda, actually have, question? I was gonna say, that's actually a perfect segue. We just got a question from someone, um, uh, Christine in New Jersey, who has is uh, keeping bees for her first year, who wants to know what kind of things she can do to protect her bees if the winter there is snowy. Great. Um, what I'll do is I'll refer you to some of the New Jersey beekeepers. They have a really good, a couple of really good beekeeping clubs up there and they can give you more local advice. It won't be radically different from what we have here. Um, it, it's more just um, what techniques do you want to employ? Do you want to use uh, insulation on the outside? Is it well protected from the wind? Do you use a screen bottom board or not? Do you put in um, uh, absorbent materials. There, there's a range of strategies that you can use. So I'd be happy to answer them you know, offline if you, if you want to explore that. And I'd be happy to send you um, contact information as well uh, for folks up, up in New Jersey. Um, and hmm? Alexandra, <laughs> you're welcome, Christine. Um, and uh, Amanda knows how to get a hold of me. Um, ah, okay, interesting. So uh, Alexandra asked about temperature for making honey. So the, the bees try to keep the young brood, and you'll see a picture of that close to the end of the video, at 93 degrees, that's their happy temperature. The queen can overwinter at a, sl a lower temperature, um, but they'll keep making honey as long as there's nectar to be had. Um, there's no you know, perfect outside temperature, Usually they're not flying if it's too far below 50 degrees, but um, you'll see them in January. If we get a sunny day and it's in the upper 40s, you'll see bees out flying around. And um, inside the colony, uh, they try to keep it warm, um, but in the winter, it'll be just that cluster and the honey might be cold, not frozen, but fairly cold, um, but that cluster will have the queen at least into the 80 degree range just to keep her alive. Um, but reproduction, keeping the larvae at 93 degrees is the ideal. Okay. But Amanda, feel free to interrupt at any point. I'm very casual about this stuff. Okay, so Ali is working on this one and I think this is where, um, uh, okay, let me stop here real quick. What I'm pointing at this rusty colored stuff in these cells is pollen. It's actually what we call bee bread. It's pollen that's been 
uh, partly uh, processed by the bees. They kind of chew it up and they put it into the cells and the enzymes that they add to it ferments the pollen through a lactic acid fermentation process um, and they cover it with a glaze of honey or nectar. So it's without oxygen and the fermentation preserves the pollen, which is their main protein source until they use it. Now they prefer fresh pollen, but this is the equivalent of honey getting them through uh, the winter. Bees don't actually eat honey directly. They dilute it to make it something closer to nectar. Nectar is their preferred sugar source, their prefer preferred uh, carbohydrate source. Fresh pollen is their preferred protein source, but they have mechanisms for preserving both over the winter or uh, for future reference. And that's what this is. So all of this is pollen. Great to see. That's exactly what we're gonna see. This has the beginnings of a classic pattern. These cells, which have little bumps on top, those are worker larvae and worker uh, pupae that are a few days away from emerging. Now, the classic pattern is a circle of the larvae followed by pollen, followed by a little bit of nectar, followed by honey. This is a little patch of honey right there. So this is good. Uh, this is exactly the kind of thing that we're gonna see in a, in a hive this time of year. Uh, it has all the right components to it. But of course, the, the, the other shoe will drop shortly. Okay, so there's an up close, lots of pollen in there. Uh, plentiful bee source. Now that one I pulled off, I should have noticed what was going on in the beginning, but I'll show you a better picture in a second. So there are two, I'll get a close up. These are worker uh, pupae that are about to emerge and that I'll add to the population. More bee bread and then another patch of honey on the outside. So think of it as a series of concentric uh, spheres uh, inside the colony. Okay, now Allie is working with this. She wants to move it over. She's trying to juggle things. Puts this one back in. And then um, I believe it's on the next frame that we pull out um, that uh, we, we, we get some interesting news. So here's Tyranny pulling out a frame. And I envy her, she has a little pocket on her. Okay, now right here, I'm pointing at a structure, which I'm gonna play around with the annotation feature just for fun here. Right here is a structure called a queen cell. We do not wanna see this at this time of the year. What this means is that the hive, because the colony makes the decision, it's not the queen. The colony decided that they, were strong enough to swarm. And so they picked individual day-old larvae and decided this one's gonna be a queen. So they started making queen cells and that is, I'll, sh I'll continue um, and I'll show you some more because it gets worse. Um, oops, oh, there we go. Okay, so that gets, that's, that was not what I wanted to see. So now we have to ask, okay, if they're swarming, is there a queen in there? Because what happens in a swarm is that the existing queen plus about half of the bees decide to take off. Before she goes, she, uh, the, the, she lays some eggs and the, the colony decides they're gonna make some queens out of a few of these, these uh, day-old larvae that she leaves behind. And then the colony gorges on honey in the hive and then flies away. And they alight on a tree to set up another colony somewhere else. Um, and that's what you, when you see a swarm, that's what you're out uh, in the wild or in your front yard, that's what it is. A colony that was strong decided to take off, but they're taking off with half of the bees in the colony typically, as well as a lot of the honey. So this colony now makes more sense. The reason why a lot of those frames were empty is because a lot of these bees had decided to fatten up and take off. Now on this one, um, we see, uh, a few more that, okay, let me put out uh, this one right here if I can get it right. This bee right there is a drone. And this is a bee that is, there we go. 
right there. There we go. This bee is thicker and fatter than the worker bees. All of these other ones are workers. Here's a drone right here. And there might be a few others in there, but the drones are fatter and are stouter and they have almost twice as many eyes. The facets on their eyes are that much greater. When you think about it, worker bee just has to go out and find a flower and come back and bring the pollen and the nectar back. Most of their life, they're in the dark, they're inside the, the hive. Um, a queen goes out once to mate, but the drones, when they go out, they're looking for a queen, so they need really good eyesight. But that's the only thing a drone does. They cruise around the hive, they eat up resources, and they go out and try to mate. And the vast majority are not at all successful. The queen will mate with about a dozen to 15 drones when she goes out on her single mating flight, comes back, and then starts laying eggs. Um, but this drone at this time of the year tells me a couple of things. One of which is, okay, if there are drones in there, then the colony was strong enough to make drones because they won't do that if they're not strong. It's a wasted resource. It could also mean that <clears throat> they uh, have swarmed and this is something that was left behind. And that again is consistent with being strong. So this is giving us some more insight as to what's going on in this particular hive. Okay, there and there. Okay, so big fat drone right there. The workers are a little bit, um, you know, they don't really care. They start chasing the drones out of the colony at this time of the year because they know that the drones aren't doing anything. They're just taking up resources. However, it's fairly warm still, so they can go out and mate if there's a queen out there to be mated with. There's a emerging bee right there. This is a little bee chewing its way out of a cell and to join all of its uh, sisters out here. Only the drones are male, the queen and all the workers are female. So that's what a emerging bee looks like after it spent uh, 21 days inside that cell. Okay, so tells us something else. There are bees that are emerging, so fine. We know that there are healthy reproduction going on. But notice that everything we see is closed. And that means that there are no uh, developing bees that are any uh, younger than about uh, a dozen days. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, about uh, 10 days. A bee is, okay. Now, this frame really gave us some insight. If you notice, all of these are queen cells. So we ended up finding something like a dozen queen cells. Now, you can't, I, I, she'll be tilting this uh, shortly, but these cells over here are still closed. This one is open. So when she turns it up, you'll see the, the bit of the inside there and I'll stop it. Um, and what that tells us is, okay, we had some bees in here. You see a lot more worker brood there still. So there's something going on. And I think she flips it over. And um, now that one that I just pointed to right there was all chewed up. That tells us that a queen emerged, went out and killed other queens that were they're still developing. And the workers are now chewing down that particular cell. And what they're gonna do, see there's another one there. And so we're right in the middle of things here. We do, my sense was okay, a couple of weeks ago, they started doing this because the queen is in herself for, for only 16 days. They develop much more quickly. And um, now I think you can see the tip of this one right there is open. This queen probably emerged, went out, killed off that queen, may well have killed off these other queens, and is somewhere floating around in the colony. The uh, punchline is we never found her that day. The next day I did go back and find her, but she was not mated. She was still newly emerged had not left the colony yet, had not left the hive yet, and was unmated. Okay, so we do have all this brood up here. So this is brood that's anywhere from uh, about 10 days to about 21 days old, probably more towards the upper end of that range. But there's a lot there. There's gonna be, they're gonna be adding more worker bees. That's just that. But these queen cells give us pause because there is not a fertile mated queen in the colony now, and there won't be for a few weeks time. So I think she tilts it up right there. And you can see, not quite, but this one has, is open on the, on the tip. All right, so 
if this happens in the spring, we have a lot of options. We can put this into another, we can actually make colonies out of each and every one of those queens if we can get them off the frame properly. Um, but this time of year, it's a real risk because um, the, we just don't know, is a frost coming next week? We don't know. If one does, then that queen is doomed. Uh, most of the colonies are kicking their drones out, so there are very few drones to be had. Many of the uh, um, colonies now, this colony is weakened because it's warm, so it's not as big as it was uh, a month ago. And we could manipulate it to try to recover it, but we just have to uh, minimize our losses. Okay, now I think, looking more here, you know, we're kind of looking for the queen, we're looking at the population. Uh, we didn't see any more queen cells, uh, but there are some drones walking around. So it's real iffy. There are drones to be had. She could go out there and mate, but um, it's not really clear. Now, I, uh, there we go. And this is, we're going further away from the center. So we're seeing more honey on the edges. And um, I think this is where the gloves fail, Allie. There we go, just pointing out some other things to make certain that we had uh, all of the components in mind. Okay, so at this point, we would like to know if we have a queen in there or at least some evidence of a queen. There's no evidence of a, ma of a mated egg laying queen because we didn't see any eggs or any young open brood. We only saw a brood that was about um, two weeks old. And as a result, uh, we just don't know uh, what what to, uh, we can find in there. Okay, I'm going to let this go in the interest of time and just make certain that uh, we cover everything in here. So we're looking more honey makes sense. Uh, it's on the more towards the outside, and um, lots of bees in there. So I'm comfortable with the number of bees in there. I'm just not comfortable with the status of the queen and her situation. So we want to know, okay, is there a queen in there laying eggs? And um, is this queen uh, in good shape? So we're going to go to the bottom box, which is typically where we would see um, queen acti uh, the all the reproduction, egg laying, larvae, uh, all the brood would be down in the bottom box. Bees have a tendency of working their ways up uh, throughout the year. Um, and particularly the summer or the winter rather, where they're not reproducing. So all they're doing is eating their way up through the honey. So we sometimes swap the boxes in the early spring. And I was manipulating this on the other colony uh, high, which we'll go into in a minute. Okay, so working with all this and um, they are uh, taking a look and um, going down to the next box. And this, these are stuck together pretty well out of prop lists, so they need to crack it and take a look there. Pull that box up, and this is going to be heavier because it has a reasonable amount of honey in it. And now we have the bottom box. Now the population here is not as big as I want it to be going into the winter, but I understand why it's this size. It's swarmed. And as we go through here, we'll see that there are um, a number of frames, but we will not find the queen or any evidence of the queen um, at that point. Now, let's see if I can, I'm just gonna go for a minute on this colony and then we're gonna jump to the next one. As we kept hoping, if we see eggs, if we find the queen, if we see any um, open larvae, then we know we have a good colony and there's still enough time this year for them to build up their population. It's a little bit late, but fortunately the weather's been warm, so a reproduction could take place. Okay, outermost frame, um, a little bit of comb, a little bit of pollen, some bees, but really not what we wanna see. Uh, we could go in a few more, similar kind of story. And trouble with all that propolis holding it together. And they'll pull this one out. Dr. Hunt, while we're watching this, we actually had one other question come into the chat um, from Marcy sure. in Hawaii. 
um, asking about why um, she, they would be seeing bees at the beach when they're at the east coast of Oahu. Not sure if they're honeybees, but you know, do they go there to die? Right. They seem struggling in the, the sand what, and they're not flying. Um, kind of what's going on there? I have no idea. <laughs> that is, uh, I, I've never heard of that before, just struggling in the sand. There are a lot of beekeepers in Hawaii because you can, you know, re they reproduce year round. Um, this is a full frame of honey, nice and heavy. Um, on that, on the other side, this side, um, you know, lots of pollen in the middle. So this is a very good resource frame. It's got all the food you need to to, to know. Marcy, I have no idea what would be causing the bees. Uh, if there were honey bees, it could have been that they swarmed and just um, got lost. Uh, I, I I really don't know. Um, you have to be careful as to whether or not they're honeybees or there's some other kind of, of bee. If they're honeybees, they're attracted to water. Although in Hawaii, I seriously doubt that they're short on water, for, except you know maybe in a few places of Kauai, but or way up in, in some of the drier areas. But I really don't know. Um, uh, okay, so another frame. Taking a look at it. Lots of bees. We're happy. So what I'm going to do is, since the, the the outcome of this is that we didn't find the queen on this excursion, we did, however, find it the next day, and then uh, we didn't see any evidence there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just skip ahead a little bit, and do they're just looking frame by frame, same story, lots of bees, uh, just a few drones, uh, no queen to be had, and then they start putting it all back together again. So put the boxes together a little bit of smoke, and that is um, kind of part of the operation here. Now, um, Jan, okay, uh, so Jan asked, what do we do with uh, honey and beeswax? Well, we just started this year, so we don't have um, a lot of that. We harvested uh, the hive that's just to my right as I'm working over here on the other direction was um, the, um, uh, from a swarm that we collected and we got about two gallons of honey off of that. So we're not generating too much, but we do have some plans for uh, generating more and finding outlets for that. Likewise with the wax, it's a little more of a hassle processing wax, but um, we do have the students engaged in a great many things. The students, for instance, painted all these hives in case you wondered how that happened. Um, they had a little party last winter and went up there and painted hives. Um, but we're, we are, we're, we're, we're thinking about that. We're thinking about what we can do and there's some ideas, but I'm trying to make this as much a student, uh, generated, uh, activity as possible. Um, and, um, as you all know, the problem with students is that they're not around in the summer. They're not many. So that's when bees need a lot of attention. Okay. So I'm just looking at these, these frames real quick to see what, what we can find. Um, these frames have a little bit of pollen, a little bit of, uh, uh, of nectar and, and honey on them. Um, we're looking for brood. Um, I don't really expect to see it on the top, but it's possible. So this is all closed brood, which is good. It's a nice, pretty solid pattern. That's healthy. A healthy brood is solid pattern. If you have a lot of holes in it, that means that the bees, something went wrong in that cell and the adult bees ripped out the larvae to get rid of it because it was infected or it, it uh, stopped developing. Okay, so uh, working through this frame, um, again, we've got, uh, uh, you know, all the components are here. We have uh, pollen right here, the bright red. We have some uh, larvae right there. Now, I think I'm waiting for her to hold up the right frame. I'll show you what yeah, this is it. Okay, I'm gonna pause right here. Get my finger out of the way. Okay, if you look in these cells, like that one and that one, and that one, and that one, these are all young larvae. They're between, these are probably about somewhere between seven and nine days old. Um, the larvae are in there, so the eggs are laid and they turn into, they, they the eggs hatch after two, Three days they turn into larvae, just tiny little maggot looking things. And the bees feed them copiously, they feed them royal jelly. And after uh, nine days, 
total length, they capped them. They put a little wax cap on it like this. And then the bees continue developing under that wax cap. Um, the wax cap helps retain uh, humidity and um, it makes development uh, more protected. Um, but seeing this tells me that there is a fertile queen in there laying eggs as of less than a week ago, which is the kind of evidence we were looking for. And there's a lot of that white royal jelly in there, which is uh, really good to see because that tells you that the, the adult bees are well nourished. They could provide lots of royal jelly to the uh, larvae and then the larvae will be well nourished, perpetuating the cycle. Um, it's pointing out different aspects of, of that particular frame. So in this case, we did find evidence of a laying queen. We, we saw very young larvae and eggs in that section that I pointed out. In the other one, we saw evidence that the, the, the colony had swarmed and that we um, had lost the original queen and that they made a new one, or we, we sort of thought they did. We didn't find it on the first day, but it is going to be in another week or two at least after that, before that queen, the new queen, starts laying eggs, um, which may be too late, but we'll just wait and see. It's all part of the, the learning exercise is to see what different patterns uh, uh, look like, see every, every colony is a little bit different, and this is the kind of stuff that uh, helps us get a better understanding as to what's going on. Okay, so there's really not a whole lot left here on this particular video. I can leave it running and maybe shout out every now and then. Um, and, you know, a good comb, but it's empty. And I think you're going to see, I think we alternate on the bottom. Yeah, empty. That's just foundation, a little bit of comb. So, so I'm going to just let this run out and um, I'll give it another five minutes or so, and then I'll show you what a queen looks like because that's what we were looking for. And I don't want to deny you the opportunity of seeing what a queen looks like. Uh, we looked in here, never found the queen on this sojourn, but there is a queen in there. And um, this is all part of the learning exercise. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop this and then I'm gonna pull over my other slide. And that is what a queen looks like right there. A um, couple of things here. You see she has this very long abdomen. Um, she's the one who makes the eggs, so she needs that extra space down there. At her core, she's nothing more than a very well-nourished worker bee. Uh, the eggs are indistinguishable. The Dale larvae, some are chosen to be a, a queen and they're lavishly fed. And because they're fed so well, their development is greatly accelerated. It takes 21 days to make a worker bee, but only 16 to make a queen bee. Now, what we do to make finding them easier is when we catch them, we can pick them up by their wings. They're not going to fly again, theoretically. There are some beekeepers, by the way, who cut uh, clip the wings in an attempt to prevent that queen from swarming. I don't do that, but um, what you can do is pick them up by the wings and then apply a dot either of ink, which is what this is, kind of like a paint, or you can buy little circle, circles that can be glued onto the thorax of the queen. It just makes it a lot easier to, to find the next time around. Now you notice all these workers, they have their antennae up and they're facing her. They're all trying to get a piece of this action. They want to touch her and pick up her pheromones, her scent. And that way they can get a sense as to who she is if they run into that smell ever again. Um, they want to know that it's a healthy scent, that the queen's in good condition. They can examine her to see are there any injuries, any parasites, uh, all of those kinds of things. And the queen just walks around and leaves her smell wherever she walks. So the, the, the bees know there's a queen in the hive, even though they, they may not see her for weeks because she's walking around in another part and seeing her actually, they may not even actually see her because it's dark inside. So they smell the, the queen smell walking around. This collection of bees around the queen is sometimes referred to as the retinue. It's a group that 
are attending to the, the queen. They might be pulling off little bits of parasite or anything of that sort. So let's see, a um, couple other questions. Dan, yes, yes. Um, so we, we have one project where we're collecting the pollen that comes in um, on the bee's legs and viewing that as essentially environmental sampling. So we'll take some of those samples and we'll test it for heavy metals. You can also test it for pesticides and some other pollutants. And if you look at colonies that are near different types of uh, environments, maybe you're near an agricultural field or near um, a coal burning power plant or near a factory or near um, uh, really any, any type of landscape that you wanna sample, a landfill, uh, uh, a junkyard, anything where there might be some flow of contaminants. If you sample the pollen, because um, pollen and wax uh, um, are, are lipophilic, so the wax absorbs all these organic compounds that are in, in coming in, and collectively they'll also absorb some of the heavy metals that might be coming in. So we, we, we have a couple of projects that are looking at the heavy metal content of components of the colony, be it the wax, be it the pollen, be it uh, the bee bread. And that's just um, uh, urban environments tend to have heavier, heavy metal loads and um, sometimes pesticide loads. It just depends on what you're close to. Um, agricultural areas almost always have heavy uh, pesticide loads. And the pesticides, to the degree they're organic compounds, meaning they're, they, they dissolve in, in oils and fats, will accumulate in the wax. And the wax is sometimes called the liver of the hive because it absorbs a lot of that pollution. In the US, there's so much of that. And as is with most of the developed world, that the cosmetics industry, which uses um, a lot of beeswax in its products, won't use, won't buy wax from North America because it's so contaminated with uh, pesticides. Uh, they'll go to a place uh, in central Germany, there's some places where they restrict the use of pesticides for a several mile radius and bees will fly up to three miles. So if you keep it clean five miles uh, or so, you're pretty much assured of pesticide free wax. Likewise, they'll go to Africa where people don't have the money uh, to pay for pesticides. So it's pesticide free because no one's uh, able to uh, pay for the pesticide in the first place for agricultural purposes. Um, so those, those are some of the aspects that, that um, uh, we're looking at in terms of bees as environmental monitors. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions in the box now, but I, I anticipate, um, oh, we have one more, uh, just sort of thanking you so much oh, for, okay. for sharing. Um, My but pleasure. I do anticipate that we will get questions um, about resources that you might suggest. I know um, it is becoming a very, um, you know, it's becoming more of a conversation about starting your own hives and keeping your own hives sure. at home. Um, you know, would you have any sort of quick resources that you would recommend and or if anyone on the webinar today is particularly interested um, and wants to drop your email address in that Q&A box for us, I can make sure to facilitate any follow-up um, if there are suggestions for resources. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I'm happy to share any information uh, as Amanda has my email address. Um, probably the single best thing to do is there are bee clubs all over the world. So track down your local beekeeping association. They almost always have courses. They some have mentor mentee uh, arrangements that you can connect with. Um, they often lend equipment or books. Uh, they have meetings and bring in speakers. Uh, there's a lot of local information and they're the ones who are doing it locally. So any local nuances will, um, will play out with, with their advice. Um, there are, uh, I, I would say that there's a lot on the internet, but as with everything, you've got to be cautious. There's, um, there's a wide range of philosophies everywhere from so-called treatment free where they don't want to do anything to some who put a lot of chemicals in their, in their hives just because there are pests and the single biggest problem, um, is depending upon where you are, it might be pesticides in some areas, but it's probably, 
uh, a mite that was introduced about, uh, what is it now, about 30, 40 years ago. And it transmits a number of viruses. And that's probably the single biggest problem. But people treat for the mites and they will treat with a range of things from powdered sugar all the way up to some pretty hard organophosphate chemicals. And um, all of those are uh, things to be aware of. Um, Amanda, are you recording this? Uh, yeah. Yes, are you? we are in fact um, recording this session. Um, we will make this available next week uh, along with a couple of other sessions from Homecoming on the Homecoming website. So when we send up a follow-up email, you will be able to find a recording of this session um, so that that will be posted. Uh, and I know we're, we're seeing a lot of other questions come in um, a little bit towards the end here. One in particular, Dr. Han, do you take volunteers to help in the summer when students are away? I'd be happy to once we get the COVID issue dealt with, because uh, even though we're outside, we still need to maintain some of the distancing issues. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I'm all for it. There are, Allie's around this summer, so she's actually been helping. I just, it's a bit of, a, bit of a, a snark on my part because there've been a lot of projects started during the academic year and then they falter over the summer because the student support diminishes. Um, um, but yeah, um, uh, so um, yeah, uh, so I'm just gonna go down this list really quick. So Jenny, you have a number of questions here, but uh, yes, this will be online as uh, Amanda just mentioned. Uh, Niels, um, yes, there are plenty. I would, I think, depending on where you are in Maryland, um, there, well, you can, why don't you just shoot me a note and I'll be happy to point you to some resources there. Uh, and again, is, is it honeybees? The most of the honey that we get around here comes from trees. It comes from tulip poplar, it comes from black locust, and it comes from basswood, uh, which are the three big nectar sources around here. Following that, it's clover, which is, you, most people don't plant that as a, in a community garden, but that's the next big one. Um, uh, Marcy, bee products, we are exploring that idea. Uh, it's mostly, uh, the appetite is there, so to speak, but it's mostly getting the mechanics in place because keeping the bees is one thing, but then harvesting the honey and bottling the honey and the labeling and all of that is another thing. So that's something which, um, um, need to be aware of. Um, Alexandra, not only are there possibly antibiotics in there, um, there's a disease called American fowl brood, which used to be a huge problem. And it is marginally treatable with tetracycline. It's not really effective. It just kind of knocks it back. American fowl brood is so bad that if a state apiary inspector sees your hive with American fowl brood, you basically have to burn the entire hive. That's the only treatment that's really um, uh, um, really acceptable. Um, but um, there are other things. Uh, if people are treating for mites, if people are treating for other, other critters, they may be using some pretty toxic chemicals. Honey doesn't pick up too much of it, uh, depending upon the chemical, um, but you just need to be careful. There's probably, uh, honey is the third most um, uh, uh, tainted uh, agricultural product in the world. We, for instance, essentially don't import honey from China because it's almost always adulterated with high fructose corn syrup or something. So you can be really careful about that. There are all these pass-throughs like right now, Vietnam is a major source of honey, but there's a certain, a fairly large amount that's uh, bogus. It's just channeled through Vietnam. Um, there's a good argument for buying local honey, particularly if you know the people making it. That's not to say it's still going to be contaminant free because if their bees are foraging in an agricultural field, there's a possibility that they could be picking up some pesticides there. But at least it is most likely to be honey rather than uh, rice syrup or, or corn syrup or something else, uh, which they're becoming increasingly sophisticated because the chemical signatures are different, but there are ways of chemically modifying other source products. And um, they're trying to over uh, to, to hide the the source of the honey. And there's a whole range of uh, chemistries uh, around that, but it's it's um, something which uh, you need to be careful. So yes, buying cheap honey in the supermarket probably means it came from Brazil or Mexico or some other country, which may or may not have the kind of controls that you want in terms of contaminants. Um, but um, 
you know, that's just a part of the, the, you know, the global um, trade and, and, and honey, among other things. So be aware of that. Um, Ling, I would say the biggest threat is uh, mites and the um, viruses that they transmit. The, the, it can be uh, weather to some degree. This year we had uh, early, a, a mild winter, early spring. We had a little bit of a bout of cool weather in the spring. And this year was, was noted in the, the DC area, was noted by lots of swarms and a lot of new queen failures. We had a lot of hives fail to requeen after a swarm for somewhat unknown reasons, but mostly it's mite control. If you control your mites, and then somewhat perversely, you might need to feed your bees to get them through the winter, because if you harvested too much honey, they don't have enough to get through the winter. And uh, um, most people around here will supplement, most people who are doing it on a um, production scale will supplement with uh, either sugar, water, or blocks of sugar. And then the bees will burn through all of that. And then you set it up so that you're collecting only nectar-based honey in the spring once the population has made it through the winter and it's built up again. Um, yeah, but sure, if any other questions, feel free to shoot me uh, a note. I'm happy to, 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 uh, to help with that, right? It's like, um, everyone, thank you so much for the, for the, um, for the kind comments here, uh, Lisa and everybody coming in from abroad. Really appreciate all of it. All right. Well, I think I know we are just about at time. Um, Dr. Han, I just wanted to thank you again for spending some time with us today for answering all of our questions. Um, for those of you who are joining us, thank you for being here. We hope we'll see you at some other homecoming at home events. Uh, we hope you all take care. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care, everyone.